Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the president throws Mexican negotiators a curveball. Now what? Plus, for all you do-it-yourselfers, an app, believe it or not, designed to get you better lumber. In Southern Gardening, Gary Bachman says it's time to throw the rules out the window. And can we show you something in a size 9? We get up close and personal with an expert in pony pumps. Farmwick starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. As you may have heard, just when we thought the new NAFTA was on its way to ratification, the president used his well-worn tariff hammer on the nation's number three trading partner. Mexico's president vowed not to be provoked, but American leaders worry that the deal may not go through. Here's Peter Tubbs. The president took a different approach on immigration, this time slapping a 5% tariff on Mexican imports with more threatened. The surprise news came just hours after Mexico's trading leaders pledged to move forward on passage of the USMCA, a major campaign promise of Donald Trump's. The White House is looking to slow the flow of undocumented immigrants into the United States. On June 10th, the United States will impose a 5% tariff on all goods coming into our country from Mexico until such time as illegal migrants coming through Mexico and into our country stop. Iowa's senior senator doesn't see a connection between the two storylines. Trade policy and border security are separate issues. This is a misuse of presidential tariff authority and counter to congressional intent. Mexico is the country's top consumer of corn exports. No word yet on retaliation by Mexico. Economists were quick to point out that tariff costs are broad and shared. The tariffs would impact our consumers and their producers. But the idea is that they're likely to retaliate, oftentimes with tariffs themselves, and that means it's hitting their consumers and our producers. So in the end, everybody shares a little bit of the cost of a trade war. And the idea is, is, is of course, to um, incentivize the uh, Mexican government to cease or slow down uh, immigration. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. The White House defended the plan, saying the tariff move was expected. The president didn't blindside his own party. If, if Republicans weren't aware, then they haven't been paying attention. I don't mean that in a bad way. But the I'm president's been talking the about policy. We notified a uh, number of members of Congress prior to the statement yesterday. But at the same time, anybody in this country or, frankly, in the world that says that they're surprised by this uh, has been living under a rock and not paying attention. Water and more water. Currently, 83 U.S. rivers are experiencing flooding, most of them in a major way. With all of that water backed up, some of those areas also dealt with severe weather as tornadoes touched down from Idaho to Pennsylvania. Here's Paul Yeager with more. During four 30-day stretches in 2003, 4, 8, and 11, reports of tornadoes topped 500 in 2019 is likely to be added to the list. Including this week, there have been 13 straight days of at least eight tornadoes a day. The National Weather Service told Kansas broadcasters to use the strongest language possible to warn people of approaching storms. The storm system proceeded to drop tornadoes on the Kansas City metro area and just west near Lawrence. Rain was the other big story of the week. Corn and soybean planting remained at historically slow levels as storm after storm kept tractors waiting to re-enter the fields. Several U.S. rivers are making life difficult for those near already swollen bodies of water that, in some cases, are reaching near record levels. The Arkansas River is expected to pass a mark set in 1990. In Fort Smith, this neighborhood was only accessible by boat. The river in the border town with Oklahoma is twice the level it was just 10 days ago. In the state of Mississippi, scenes like this have played out for the last four months. 
The epic flooding of today in the Delta rivals the great floods of 1973 and 1927. This year I have planned on planting corn, and I did not get a chance to do so because the water started rising back in February, and we did not get an opportunity. I got the land ready, but I didn't get a chance to get it planted before the water started rising back in February. Many called him a giant in the U.S. Senate. Thad Cochran was Mississippi's senior senator when he retired in April of 2018. He'd been retired just a year when he passed May 30th. Cochran spent more than half his life in Congress, a total of 45 plus years between the House and Senate. He spent another two in the U.S. Navy. In this file video, a research center in his name was dedicated at the Mississippi State University in 1998. Known as the Quiet Persuader, Cochran ended his career in 2018 as chairman of the powerful Senate Appropriations Committee. He was deeply respected in his home state and elsewhere. Mississippi's Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson had this to say, I am saddened to learn of the passing of U.S. Senator Thad Cochran. A true statesman, Senator Cochran exemplified the qualities of a steadfast leader with a true servant's heart. He fought not only for Mississippians, but for all Americans. The MSU Extension expressed its condolences in part by saying his long-lasting positive impact on MSU Extension and tomorrow's leaders will continue to shape our state. He lived the 4-H motto and dedicated his life to making the best better. Thad Cochran was 81 years old. As almost everybody knows when it comes to picking lumber for building or repair projects, if you expect every piece of lumber to be perfect, you might as well give up. There's just no such thing as a perfect piece of wood. That doesn't mean you'll never find better than average lumber. It just means that to get a better one of these, you might need one of these. Here's Farm Week's Amy Myers with an explanation. So, how does your lumber stack up? Almost every homeowner who's ever built or repaired something would agree that lumber selection can totally splinter your patience. But now, technology to the rescue. A new app developed at Mississippi State called Smart Thumper lets you test your lumber before you waste your time and energy hammering it into place. Actually, it works two different ways. Uh, one way is through vibration, where you uh, suspend the piece of lumber on each end. You put the smartphone in the middle and tap it or thump it, and the vibration of the lumber is picked up by the accelerometer in the iPhone, and from that it calculates the frequency, and from the frequency then it can calculate the stiffness. Professor Seal says the second way is to hold your phone at the end of the board and tap with the hammer. The higher the board's quality, the better the result, according to the app. An app that's easy to use and quick with the readout. Seal's co-developer, Mayhan, says making the app user-friendly was high priority. The most important document in our project was actually the instruction, instruction so that um, the users actually have uh, like accurate information of how the app was developed and then how that works. So that was something that I was really focused on. With Smart Thumper, you get the step-by-step -step for the type of wood you're using, including measurements. And because wood is one of the most widely used building materials in the world behind concrete, Seal says the time, effort, and frustration you save make the app indispensable for anyone who uses it. It should be used by do-it-yourself uh, carpenters, uh, home builders, uh, engineers, architects, and other scientists that want to relate uh, stiffness to whatever product they're testing. We often assume the lumber we buy is strong enough as long as the board looks straight, but just imagine with Smart Thumper being able to look beyond what the naked eye can see with just a thump and a tap. I'm Amy Myers reporting. And in case you were wondering, Smart Thumper is very accurate. In a 2000 board test, it measured 98% accurate compared to conventional and expensive wood testing equipment. You can find it in the App Store, and an Android version is due out soon. In Southern Gardening Today, rules? Well, there are no rules. At least that's Gary Bachman's opinion. Your landscape, of course, is there for your pleasure, and no one says you can't make all the decisions. Here's Gary. I 
I'm asked all the time about landscape design, as if there's rules to follow. That's exactly why I like to visit my friend Jane's garden. Now don't get me wrong, Jane is serious about her landscape. I love her front plantings, which consist of an eclectic mix of nice plant material. Approaching the front door, I like the spring growth on the golden thryallis displayed on the rusty brown stems. In July, these shrubs will put on a display of bright yellow flower clusters, each tinged with red stamens and pistils. The head-high pinkish angel trumpets with their downward pointing flowers are just starting to bloom. Look at all the buds hanging, waiting their turn to shine. I love the Mexican heather growing along the front border. These look good around the base of the kneeling terracotta warrior. The profuse purple flowers are produced on compact plants. These plants are regularly divided and replanted, filling in spaces around the landscape. And how about the coarse and interesting texture of this agave or century plant? I've always thought of these as being solitary plants. It's surprising to me how many little baby agave offsets are produced around the base of the plant. The garden should be a place to enjoy and have fun, so go ahead and get some interesting plants for your landscape. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. A short market report today. The National Pork Producers Council said in a recent statement, quote, American pork producers cannot afford retaliatory tariffs from its largest export market tariffs, which Mexico will surely implement. It is pushing for the president not to impose that 5% tariff we mentioned earlier in the show. And dairy farmers are concerned about retaliatory tariffs on U.S. cheeses, for example. The National Milk Producers Federation says producers have lost at least $2.3 billion in revenues through March due to higher tariffs against U.S. dairy. And with corn under the gun weather-wise, today's trivia quiz is apropos. The question, how many gallons of water per day can evaporate from an acre of corn? Is the answer A, 1,000 gallons, B, 2,000 gallons, C, 3,000 gallons, or D, 4,000 gallons? We'll have the answer coming up shortly. The latest cattle on feed report shows a growing inventory, even though on feed levels and placed cattle numbers are well below estimated levels. I had a chance to sit down with ag economist Josh Maples. Here's what he had to say. Josh, was this latest report another record for cattle supplies? It was, Mike. So we're looking at 11.8 million head of cattle on feed. This is the largest total for any May 1st uh, on record, going back to at least 1996 when the reporting started. Uh, and this was up about 2% above the same period last year. Okay. What's driving the increase? So really the, the, the driver right now is we're placing more cattle into feedlots. And so placements were up about 9% uh, compared to a year ago. And believe it or not, that increase is actually smaller than a lot of analysts expected it to be. Uh, so just a lot more cattle going into feedlots right now. Uh, and that's pushing up the total number of cattle on feed. Is this lower number... Um uh, is, is it really a positive for the markets overall? So it's the lower than expected. So, you know, kind right. of expecting a 12 to 13 percent increase compared to last year, and we only had a 9 percent increase. Uh, so that was generally a positive thing for prices. You know, supplies were a little bit lower than we might have expected. Mm -hmm. And if you look at how the markets reacted in the days after the report, uh, you didn't really see a lot of price increases, but we at least saw maybe some of those decreases uh, kind of temper the decreases that we've been seeing for the last couple of weeks. So more cattle entering feedlots. How about cattle leaving feedlots uh, to be marketed? Sure. So marketings for this report were up about 7%. Uh, one thing to keep in mind there is we did have one more business day uh, during April of this year, whenever the, you know, keeping track of these numbers mm -hmm. uh, was occurring. Then we had the, in April of 2018. So that was one piece of it. Uh, but overall, the marketings are very well anticipated. So not a lot of uh, market movement driven by the marketings number. Uh, it's really more of a placement story for this particular report. So overall, your reaction to the report and its, its impact on the market? Yeah, so I think really it is a positive report for prices. You know, we've been in a, about a two to three week slide in the cattle market. Uh, we've seen 
uh, cattle prices decreased pretty significantly uh, going into the summer months. I think this report specifically, we didn't see as many placements as we might have thought. And then another part of that is the placements that we did see were all heavier placements. Uh, so those cattle aren't going to spend as long in feedlots uh, as the cattle that might have been placed a little bit lighter. So if we look at the, that 9% increase in placements, uh, about 60% of that increase was driven by cattle that weigh more than 700 pounds. So those cattle are going to be out of feedlots uh, more than likely by August. So maybe it helps us think a little bit more positive about October and November uh, than we were thinking prior to this report. And of course that's important because that's a, you know, a primary selling time for a lot of producers uh, and what's going on in cattle markets during the fall months are, is, can really affect uh, Mississippi producers and everybody, all producers bottom line. Back to the trivia quiz now. Today's question, how many gallons of water per day can evaporate from an acre of corn? Was the answer A, 1,000 gallons, B, 2,000 gallons, C, 3,000 gallons, or D, 4,000 gallons? Well, believe it or not, corn can evaporate a lot of water per acre in just a day. The answer is D, 4,000 gallons. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, they call them farriers, specialists in the art of shoeing horses and caring for their hooves. For us, trimming our nails is just part of looking presentable, but if you are a horse, trimmed and balanced hooves are critical. What does it take to be a farrier? How do you master the craft? Do you have to be part blacksmith, part veterinarian? Just a few of the questions we'll answer coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, if you're considering purchasing or selling timberland or just want to know more about managing property you already own, consider buying, managing, and selling Timber 101 at the Tate County Extension Office in Senatobia on Tuesday, June 11th. It's actually a two-part seminar. Part two is on the 13th. The fee is $30 a person or $45 a couple and space is limited. Call right away for more info, Tara Ferguson at 662-562-4274. Next on June 24th and 25th in Starkville at Mississippi State University, the Mississippi Grazing and Forage Production Workshop. In the first day from 4.30 to 7.30 p.m., there's an outdoor forage tour focused on grazing management, variety testing, weed control, and forage fertility. The second day, Indoors All Day, features a number of speakers in diverse topics related to forage production and grazing management. Seating is limited there, too. Cost is $60 a person. For more information, call Dr. Rocky Lemus at 662-325-7718. For horses walking around on bad shoes or untrimmed hooves, there's a lot at stake to avoid pain and injury. Commissioning the work of a good certified farrier is very important. Farm Week's Amy Myers has just the guy for you. Meet Sandy Macbeth. Horses are complex, majestic animals that serve many purposes, like for hobbies, competitive events, and farm work. As strong and powerful as they are, horses' health and quality of life fall directly on the owner's responsibility. Equine hoof maintenance must be a top priority. This involves the art and craftsmanship of a farrier like Sandy Macbeth of Philadelphia, Mississippi. Macbeth says horses virtually cannot live with unhealthy feet. You need to have a properly trimmed hoof to balance the bony column of the leg. You want the joint spaces to be even. You want the joints to line up. If they don't line up, the horse will get sore, get lame, and you won't be able to use him. Doesn't matter if he's just a trail riding horse, race horse, or top show horse in the country. The whole leg has to be lined up where the joints are comfortable. Just like a person, if we're, our knees are not lined up, we get sore. We don't want to work. Horses are the same way, but they can't tell us 
we have to look at them, evaluate them, to see how they're moving. Macbeth says one misconception is that proper hoof care is only required for horses ridden regularly, competitively, or used for work. But even pasture horses require some level of footwork and will suffer greatly if neglected. Horses hoof capsule, a lot of people think it's just a bony column with nothing inside it. But inside that hoof capsule, there's two and a half bones, miles of circulatory system, and nerve endings. They're just like our fingernail. If you rip your fingernail off, you touch your finger with something, it hurts. Therefore, a horse can, they have to stand on it all the time. And if it's cut too short, they're standing on that foot and they can't take any pressure off of it and get any rest. Where we can, if we cut a fingernail too short, we don't have to reach and pick stuff up. General rule of thumb, if you're trimming a foot and if you get it too short and you get blood coming out, red means danger, stop. You better back up and do something else. What do you do to cure that? Well, you, uh, if you get too close and have, <laughs> and have blood coming out, you can put a pad on it, you can doctor it, put medication on it, and try to take the pressure off that one spot. Macbeth emphasizes that it's crucial to rest the horse until completely recovered, even if no signs of pain are showing. Symptoms of discomfort include shifting their weight, not being able to stand for more than a few minutes on each foot, walking cautiously over rocks or hard surfaces, and swelling on the leg. A horse may also jump or pull away when handled or when pressure is applied to the foot sole. This could be due to an abscess, bruising, poor farrier work, injury, or a number of other problems. Horse owner Rachel Carter says it's imperative to alert a farrier immediately if hoof work is needed. You always need to let your farrier know if, if your horse throws a shoe very quickly after, after being shod or any problems that, are, that have been going on before they shoe your horse. That way they know how to make the best decision possible for your horse. Horses ridden regularly or do any kind of labor need shoes. A pasture horse not ridden frequently usually just needs a regular trim unless the hooves wear down too easily without shoes. These days, technology makes finding the right shoe easier. Through the years, different companies, different manufacturers have duplicated the handmade type horseshoe to make fronts and hinds, lefts and rights, put clips on them, put any modification you need. And it takes less less hammering to get them shaped to fit the horse's foot. And every horseshoe has to be shaped. Macbeth says a good farrier still must know how to make their own in order to understand how to correctly customize a shoe. This age-old process involves heating and shaping steel and imprinting it to the hoof. This does not hurt the horse. Understanding hoof anatomy, proper nail size to use, and how to avoid nailing into the blood supply and soft tissue is key. Macbeth explains achieving the right fit. If he's a just a trail riding horse, you put a standard horseshoe on it. If it is a rainer, you put a sliding plate on the back. A lot of your pleasure type horse, show pleasure horses, you put aluminum shoes on the front because they're lighter. But the fit, you want the shoe to be an extension of the hoof capsule. You want it to come back and be a base of support. You want to come around the rear quarters of the foot, have okay. some expansion so the foot won't grow over the shoe. We can't put too much back there, but we have to have enough support to, so that foot will expand and contract as the horse moves. So after hearing Sandy Macbeth talk about the dangers of not trimming your horse's feet correctly or shoeing a horse improperly, I got curious as to what some bad cases might look like when it comes to hoof or foot neglect. And so, as you can see in the picture, this pasture horse wasn't trimmed for months and obviously needs attention before injury sets in. Now, in one of the extreme cases I found, this pony's hooves actually look like corkscrews. Clearly very painful. Luckily, rescuers found him. Of course, a very experienced, skilled farrier was able to rehabilitate those feet. Regarding foot care or any type of health issue, Rachel Carter says it's vital to consult still, professionals yeah. versus uh, doing yeah. your own research. Okay. Veterinarians and farriers have, have received training, and you really need to work with your veterinarian and trust information that they um, that they give you. It's very important that farriers are accessible and available and just have good business practices with returning phone calls and being organized. Horseshoe veterinarian owner has to be on the same page. The veterinarian has the diagnostic tools. They can ultrasound. They can radiograph. Some owners they don't want anybody to know the problems their horse has, but they'd be a lot better off telling us 
as farriers what the problems are. The owners see the horse every day. We as farriers only see it every four to six weeks. They can tell us all the symptoms and we can decide as a team what we need to do to make the horse better. Sandy McBath often extends knowledge of his craft to Mississippi State University veterinary students. Although they're not studying to be certified farriers, it's important to know the basics. After all these years working on horses, McBeth says the best part is knowing he's made life better for these animals and their owners. For when we take care of our horses, they take care of us. That was Amy Myers reporting. She says everyone needs their shoes. She has trimmed horses herself and says Sandy has a wide reputation as an expert farrier. Well, next week on Farm Week, she's a dancer, pageant winner, Hall of Famer, and maybe a future scientist. But Emma Grace McGrew says she's just a country girl, and it all started with 4-H. Luck and a good smile only take you so far. Everyone says she was a hard-working 4-H'er with a lot of get up and go. The results? See for yourself when we meet Emma Grace McGrew next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.